Hi, I'm Bruce Fretz. I'm here to host our Zoom SAG After Foundation Q&A with Susie Nakamura from Avenue 5 and many other wonderful roles. Um, we're doing this online, obviously, because of the COVID-19 crisis. And we also wanted to let people know that there is a COVID-19 fund that the Screen Actors Guild After Foundation is, um, has organized. So if you want more information on that, look below to the comments. And you can find out about how you can get help from the SAG After Foundation. Uh, during this coronavirus crisis where obviously production is shut down uh, pretty much everywhere. So, but we continue to do Q and A's with interesting actors. And today we're lucky to be joined by Susie Nakamura. Susie, hello, how are you doing? Hi Bruce, nothing can stop a Q and A, That's nothing. True. That's true. So we're here to talk about uh, your career and particularly about Avenue 5, which just finished its first season. Mm -hmm. um, on HBO, great uh, comedy uh, set in outer space, uh, mm -hmm. or is it? But we don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you get involved? I know you're working with Armando Iannucci, and you've been on Deep before. Is that was that the connection that got you to this? Yeah, or it? yeah. I auditioned for Veep, and uh, uh, I should know what season. I don't. That's I don't okay. I don't remember Mrs. season four maybe or something like that and yeah. I got to work with Armando and um, yeah and then this this project came up and uh, I got to audition for Iris and it was just I love the writing I love the scene and um, and that was it so how would you describe the character of Iris she's sort of the right hand person to the billionaire played by Josh Gad who's kind of funding this whole thing, but it seems like sometimes she's maybe more in charge than he is, would you say? Yeah, she's definitely the brains uh, <laughs> of the operation. I mean, in this, I mean, I think I can describe her in a number of ways. She's sort of, yeah, the right-hand man. Um, the, she's basically like the, maybe the CE, CEO or mm -hmm. COO or, you know, definitely, uh, the, the you know the 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 thi the person that gets stuff done right right after Judd spouts whatever garbage comes out of his mouth <laughs> but uh, you know it's 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 interesting when you originate a character for a series that basically doesn't exist yet you're really you're 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 really uh, creating something yes and that's why I love working with Armando and his and his writers is it's very collaborative and they. They, they're very open to feedback when you're developing the character. And it's not just the writing, but it's also you coordinate with the wardrobe and makeup and hair. What does this character look like? And yes. what does she wear? And, and so that's really wonderful. So Iris I, I sort of developed as this right-hand man type of character, but I, I, I wanted her to be a little bit more than that. And working with Josh Gad is just so wonderful because he's very collaborative too. Yes. And he developed this, you know, this sort of partnership <laughs> as dysfunctional as it is. <laughs> I didn't want him, I didn't want Iris to be a yes man or a straight man or anything like that. And right. I, I, I found that if I treated him almost like a brother, that, mm -hmm. was, that was what worked best for me, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I know you have a background in improv, coming from Second City in Chicago. I mean, do you use that on the show, or is the show pretty well scripted and the, the development is more kind of before you go before the cameras, you're sort of contributing ideas for the character and things like that? Yeah, most of the development happens before the cameras start rolling. Um, yeah. But, you know, once we're on set, it, you know, the, uh, Armando usually allows us to do a, an extra take or a fun take, and, right. and it's still pretty loose, but, the you know, the words we say... Uh, is is scripted right. and but i also think the highest compliment is when people think we're improvising <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, right, right but and then the wonderful thing about this production and what i found with veep as well is that you you um have the luxury of like rehearsing with the script in your hand before mm. you even see the set and that way you can kind of develop through improvisation you know, what's happening here? What are they saying? How are they feeling? Why are they there? And all that stuff. And then the writers go back and write that. And then by the time we get to set, it's in the script. Right, right, right. 
So, I mean, how would you say you contributed to the development of the character? I mean, you mentioned the character has a very specific look. Um, was that a lot of your input in terms of creating Iris's uh, persona? Yeah, and, you know, we tried a, a bunch of different hair and, um, I mean, for personal reasons, I don't like wearing a lot of makeup. <laughs> <laughs> so my input was, I don't think Iris wears a lot of makeup. <laughs> because she just doesn't have time. She's just, yeah. she's just too efficient. Uh, which I think is true, but, you know, for selfish reasons, I, I sort of, create, <laughs> I sort of uh, threw that in there. And then yeah. part of Iris's hair was an accident. She was supposed to have bangs. Mm -hmm. But in, in, the, in the UK, they call it fringe. She was supposed <laughs> to have fringe. And so during the hair test, I had this fringe uh, right before I had my makeup test. And they said, hey, can you, get, can you get it out of her face so we can do her makeup test? And they just kind of pinned it up like that. And mm -hmm. then that was. Then it worked. Iris's hair was born. <laughs> it was kind of sculptural and it looked futuristic a little bit, but not nothing crazy. And I liked right. how there was almost like a traditional Japanese uh, hair aspect about it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, had you met or worked with Josh Gad or, or Hugh Laurie for that matter before or anyone else in the ensemble? I mean, there's a lot of people with a lot of comedy experience. I have not worked yeah. with, I, uh, Hugh Laurie and I were in the same uh, episode of Beep, Beep, but we, in the series finale, but we never saw right. each other because we were shooting <laughs> multiple units that day. Um, yeah. But I did see his name on the call sheet and I said, you know, <laughs> if, I see, if I see him, I'm going to go up to him and say, uh, I'm working with you on Avenue 5, but we weren't even, we weren't even close to each other. Um, and I worked with Josh before on a series called Back to You with Patricia Heaton and Kelsey Grammer. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it was really, it was really nice to just, and the fact that we worked so closely together was just really nice to work with a familiar face. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And Armando Iannucci's comedies have a very specific tone. It's a little bit heightened. It's very fast. I mean, how do you know when you're hitting it? I mean, especially because you don't have a live audience there as you have on, on some, you know, sitcoms that you've done. How do you know that you're in the zone? I mean, do you just kind of trust them to, to pull you back or push you if you need to be, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, fe I think that that's true for anything that, for any pilot or anything that you haven't done before is your trust has to go into the, the showrunner or the visionary or the director, or whatever, um, because you're not matching anything. Yeah. You know, it's not like when you go on a, a if you're doing a guest star on a, an established show, you understand what it looks like already. You understand the tone. But when you're doing a pilot, uh, at least in, in my case, all, all of my trust went into Armando. Mm -hmm. and well, he's, just, good for trust. he's got a good track record, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, how would you say your character evolved over the course of the first season? Or what did you kind of learn about her as you were playing her from, from episode to episode? Um, what was interesting about this process is none of the actors knew what the arc was going to be. Mm -hmm. And we discussed with each other, if, do we want to know? <laughs> and I think the general consensus was that we didn't want to know where our mm -hmm. characters were going by the last episode. Uh, only because we wanted to feel very present while we were doing or dealing with whatever crisis was at hand. Mm -hmm. um, and I know Iris was, is very buttoned up and uh, type A, organized, conservative in a way. And so I didn't want to know where she ended up because I didn't want to adjust my performance no knowing that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, do you prefer working on, you know, TV series that are open-ended and you don't know where things are going as opposed to a, a film or a play where you know the whole arc of the character going in? Uh, yeah, there's sort of a freedom in not knowing and it does keep you present. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's arcs that exist where you need to know what happens uh, because maybe you have to telegraph a plot point or you have mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, know where your extremes are so that you can modulate that moving towards the, you know, ultimate whatever. But generally, maybe it's because I'm from improvisation. I don't mm -hmm. want to know. 
Right. But, and, and in the same sense, a lot of times the writer's room doesn't know. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's get back into your improv background and starting out. You were born in Chicago, correct? You grew up in Chicago. I mean, how would you say just in general being from Chicago uh, shaped you as a person? Uh, I think being from Chicago shaped everything about me. I mean, I don't know. if Do you know a lot of people from Chicago? I do. I do. We love our city more than any (laughs) other person from another city. It's a great city. Yeah. People have our, the Chicago flag tattooed on their bodies. It's, it's, right. a, it's a spe- special kind of love. And I think uh, it's because it, it's, a, it's an art town and it's a working class town simultaneously. Mm-hmm. I love the idea that uh, art is for everybody and the city of Chicago embraces that. Mm-hmm. So that, and culture is for everybody. So there's public art and there's free concerts and there's, you know, it, it, there's no class system when it comes to culture. Right, right. And that's just a wonderful environment to grow up in. And I, I thought the world was like that. And then the more I traveled and the more, and the more I experienced, I realized, oh no, it's not like that. That's, it's, it's, a, it's a special place to grow up in. Right, right. So when did you know that you wanted to become an actor? Uh, I always kind of did it. I did it in grade school. Uh, I did it in high school. I, did, I didn't really realize it was a job. That's the other thing I think that separates Chicago actors from, from everyone else is that it's, uh, there's a work ethic in the Midwest, especially where it's, it's like you have to work. You have to have a job. And so I didn't know acting was a job, so I didn't realize <laughs> it was an option. So I always, I, you know, I had other jobs while I did uh, theater. And, um, and then when I realized, when I got into Second City and, and realized I could get paid, uh, mm-hmm. that's when I kind of shifted my focus or, or focused more on acting as a career. Right, right. And how did you discover Second City? I mean, did you go as an audience member first and then think, I want to do this? Or did you hear about it once you were already acting and kind of move in that direction? Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's an iconic theater in yeah. Chicago. It's, it's not a big theater. It's very small. There's only six, seven people in a cast. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the reputation, obviously, is, 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 is much larger. But my, my mother uh, saw the Blues Brothers. <laughs> And she, uh, she said, she told me, you know, those guys are from a theater here. Yeah. And I think, I mean, the Blues, Brother, the Blues Brothers was the only movie my mother saw twice. Really? Yeah. So, and there was swearing in it. Yeah. And, uh, but she, and she loved that they shot it. You know, they drove yeah. a, bu- a bunch of cars through Daly Plaza. She just yeah. loved that that the whole experience, the shooting, the seeing the movie. And I think that had the biggest influence on me is I wanted to be a part of whatever that <laughs> thing was that she loved so much that, yeah. that you could swear and it was okay. <laughs> um, so would you say your parents in general were supportive of your pursuit of acting then or were they concerned at all about you? Yeah, I mean, every parent is concerned, I think, when one of their children wants to enter the arts. Uh, I understand it better now than I did back then. I thought they were trying to stop me, but the truth, they were very supportive. They, were, they never yeah. told me not to do it. Their biggest concern was, how are you going to retire? How are you going to have health insurance? That, that kind of thing. How are you going to pay your rent? How are you going to feed yourself? Um, and that's a valid concern. I mean, if one of my nieces or nephews said they wanted to enter the arts, I, w- I would have the exact same concerns. <laughs> you know, and, they, and they'd be valid because you have to be, it, it's a business, you know, and you're, independ- you're an independent contractor. You have to be good with money. You have to um, have an emergency fund. Right. Bigger than most people if they have an emergency fund. You do right. live paycheck to paycheck. So, uh, yeah, it's, they were very supportive in general. I think right. they were just sort of worried about how, uh, how, how I can do this for decades. Right, right. Well, you have. You've been very successful. And, and you mentioned work ethic. I mean, you, you work very hard. You've appeared on so many different shows. I mean, 
Um, when did you feel like, okay, I know I'm going to make it as an actor now. Like I've, I've crossed the threshold. Of oh God, you never make it. You, <laughs> there yeah. is no make it really. I, I think you just got to keep doing it. You just do it. You just, you just do it or you don't do it. But there is yeah. no s sort of, you know, quantifiable point that is success. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very, I do feel very lucky. I, I, you know, I keep thinking I'm mic'd, that's, but I'm not. <laughs> that's just sort of like a, uh, an ingrained thing of like, don't touch here because there's a mic there. Um, uh, what was I saying? Just about, <laughs> you know, making it. I mean, I read that yeah. you got your second after card from a, a Boston Market commercial, right? You were, you were just kind of in the background. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, w I would hate other artists to, to enter, you know, whatever they choose to and think, well, I hope I make it because there, cause I don't think there is, there is that end point. Right. Mm -hmm. And they, they would just be disappointed because they would just always think they never made it. But in the mean, if they look back, like if I look back, I've been doing it for a long time. Uh, and I'm very happy about that. And I, I do feel very grateful. I've been very lucky. Yeah. And I've read that you said you sort of approach auditions differently than most actors do and that you don't necessarily look at it as you're trying to land this job. You look at it as you're going to get to perform for these people in this room. Is that an accurate uh, representation of your attitude? Yeah. Don't other people don't feel that way? <laughs> I don't know. I mean. Maybe because maybe I come from sketch, baby. Yeah. And so a lot of my performances are only 90 seconds long or two and a half minutes or whatever, you know, like I only yeah. do something for four minutes and I'm done. Yeah. Uh, that's a fantastic format. And so when you go to an audition, you're just performing for this live audience for, you know, two minutes and 50 seconds or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And when it's done, it's done. And uh, I don't know. I like that. It's very satisfying to me. Yeah. Is it possible to sum up what you learned at Second City? I mean, what, what the most useful part of those years were for you that you still kind of draw on on a daily basis? Yes. I, I, it took me a really, really long time to uh, know who I was on stage. And I try and go back to that. When I audition, I try, I try you know, you're still performing for a live audience. And so the laughs come when you are, you tell the truth in some aspect. So those are the two things that I, I go back to. The laughs come when you tell the truth and it's very, very difficult to be, to be yourself and to know, know who you are on stage so that you can depart from that. Mm -hmm. Have you always been drawn to comedy? I know you've done some drama too. You were on the West Wing for a while and uh, The Closer and other shows like that. I mean, has, has comedy always kind of been your your passion or not necessarily? Uh, it's definitely been my bread and butter. Yeah. It's, comedy is my survival job, but I do, <laughs> but I do love drama. Yeah. I, I, I love them both for different reasons. What are the different reasons? Uh, I, I, I don't want to say comedy is easy, but it's, cause it's not, as yeah. they say. Uh, but it's, um, it's, it's, I get, I get gratification from doing drama because it's difficult in a different way. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Is it harder to gauge how you're doing because you don't have an audience reaction when you're doing drama? Like if you're, if you're good in a drama, you don't get the feedback of laughter that you do in a comedy or is that not the, the main Well, difference? even when you're doing a drama, like I've done, you know, with straight plays and you could, even though you're not getting laughs, you could still feel the audience reaction yeah. uh, and there is something very immediate about that that you don't get when you're shooting mm -hmm. because you're kind of shooting into this black hole and they store it and it goes into post and then mm -hmm. it airs six months later and then that's when you get your reaction and you're not even in the room with them. So it's, it's a very bizarre transition to go from live theater to television and film. But you do, you're, you're, there's, it's, you're not acting in a vacuum, you're still on a set with crew members and, a, and the ADs and the director. And so there, there are people around you and very much like at Second City when you, when you wanted to make the piano player laugh. I, you know, I, would, I love making a crew person laugh. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. you know, or react to what I'm doing, even if it's a drama, react to what I'm doing positively in that room. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you have a favorite role or favorite experience that meant particularly something meaningful to you uh, over the the many, many projects you've worked on? Uh I, you know, I've done a lot of independent films and uh, yeah. they're, they're, they're very gratifying. And very much like working with Armando and Yanucci where you put your, uh, you know, entire trust into him. That's mm-hmm. what doing an independent movie is. There's one person, there's no networks, there's no studios that are giving right. notes. It's usually one person um, and it's their vision and it's your job to help them you know, flesh it out or fulfill this. And so you give this singular person uh, all of your trust. And that's mm-hmm. a very gratifying experience. Are there any particular want to mention that people might want to seek out since everyone's sitting at home looking for things to watch on? Oh, <laughs> I don't, but that's the other difficult thing about independent, independent films. It's difficult to have a life outside of the theater. I mean, outside of the festival circuit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I did a, I did years ago, I did a, a film called um, Strawberry Fields, where I was a teenage pyromaniac. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another okay. favorite is Harmony, Harmony and Me, made by uh, Bob Byington. I had a small role in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's mm-hmm. a filmmaker outside of, uh, uh, in Austin, Texas. And yeah. I worked with him a couple of times. And I also liked working on uh, Men of a Certain Age. I love that show. I yeah. love that show too. It was one of those yeah. shows that you, I would, I loved watching. Uh, yeah. Separate from the fact that I was on it. Right, right, right. I mean, you've done a lot of guest starring roles on shows. Um, what's it like to come into a show that's been running for a few years and you, you know you're only there for a week? I mean, how do you kind of get up to speed with what the, you know, what it's like to to fit in, you know, and that kind of, a, it can be a difficult, I think, situation. I think it's, I think it's one of the hardest jobs. And I, I know, um, you know, it's rarely acknowledged that way because you, you know, you're only in for the week, but it is like jumping rope or like trying to jump in a, a mm-hmm. jump rope that's already going, right? And you, you have to gauge not just who your character is within the context of the show, but the people, you know, there's a crew that's already running like a well-oiled machine. <laughs> Everyone's familiar with, you know, with each other. And it's, it's like starting a new high school constantly over and over and over again. Yeah. But I think that's where, you know, the, the character actors shine. It's hard to talk about it without sounding like I'm, I'm praising myself, but I, ad, I, I admire character actors so much, so I, I feel like I, I want to give them credit. Uh, but it, that's one of the hardest parts of what we do is sort of jumping in that jump rope that's already going. Yeah. Plus, you have to learn your lines. You have to do a good job. And honestly, guest stars don't have the luxury of fucking up. Excuse me. That's okay. You can, you can swear on here. <laughs> With YouTube, you know, it's, we don't have, not, the, you know, we don't have the luxury of messing up or relaxing, yeah. you know, because because we are only there for a week or or for right. three days, and right. so take after take, you just you cannot cannot mess up your line. I feel yeah. that pressure, but I also feel very gratified when you know you can go in and out, and you you know you only need a couple takes. Mm-hmm. Do you have role models as an actor other than the Blues Brothers? Um, people who you look to as kind of, you know, those kind of career that you would like to have? Oh, my God, yeah. Margot Martindale, Allison Janney, Stephen mm-hmm. Tobolowski. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you look at their resumes and it's just, they've done everything and they've done everything well. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's the greatest lesson that you've learned from another actor that you can pass along to the actors who are watching this now? Oh, wow. Oh, my God. I don't like giving advice. <laughs> like the bet that, uh... oh, uh, I do remember David Krumholtz telling me that, you know, I need to rehearse the jokes before the table read. Really? Yeah. And that was a really good piece of advice. It's not just you telling the joke, right? You don't, mm-hmm. you don't just want your jokes to land. You want your scene partner's jokes to land. So if you're mm-hmm. setting up a joke, 
th their joke and it's your fault that it bombs, that mm. joke is going to get cut for that other person. <laughs> ah, so, yeah. So you have to, before a table read, uh, you know, rehearse not just your own stuff, but anything you're setting up for someone else. Right, right, right. So do you know what you're going to be doing next? I mean, Avenue 5 will be coming back at some point, I take it. Um, do you know what's going to happen? Your character had a bit of a cliffhanger at the end of the, the season there. Do you know yeah. yet where, where things are going? I do. I, I had a, a Zoom meeting <laughs> oh, good. with Armando, and he kind of, uh, you know, gave me the arc of what, what they're thinking about for season two. And it's very exciting. I, I, there's nothing else I, can, I can't. Especially yeah, for no, people who haven't yeah. seen the series, uh, it's different, and it's yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, sure. Are there other projects that you're working on right now during this kind of enforced hiatus of, that you're excited about? Or I fin well, I finished uh, season two of Dead to Me before mm -hmm. uh, we got locked down. That premieres in May, I believe, on Netflix. And I also uh, come back uh, for season two of Tacoma FD, which is airing right now on True TV. There's that work ethic. There's that Chicago, you know, Midwestern. <laughs> You're on three shows at once. How do you do yeah. it? And I'm, I'm, I'm actually on another show, but I don't know if I can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think drives you to work so hard? I mean, is it just what you love to do or? I don't know if I work any harder. I just, uh, it's my job. Like, yeah. it's my job. It's not my dream. It's not my hobby it's what i do and i should do you know something every day <laughs> right well you do it very well as evidenced by the very impressive credits that you've racked up over the years and you just continue to keep uh seemingly getting better and better so we thank, thank you. you so much for taking the time to join us today and uh keep up the good work thanks so much it was great to talk about what I do, <laughs> it really was. I I re I don't I don't think I have the opportunity to talk about sort of the everyday. Yes. You know the mat, the 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 gears and wheels that have to turn to get to to have a career. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I don't want to say it's. I it's interesting that I'm talking about it, but it's interesting <laughs> to think about that, you know, there's young, there's actors who are listening to this. Yes. Uh, uh, hope, you know, hopefully we'll have a long career and, and, uh, and see it as a job. Well, I'm sure they can learn a lot from your example. So thanks again for joining us. I really appreciate it. I hope so. Thanks, Bruce. Nice to talk sure. to you. Nice talking to you. Stay safe. Yes, you too.